It is good to see you on this holy Sabbath day. I know of no greater way to begin the week than in God's house and worship. So it's good to see you. And what a great week it is. The Olympics are going on. Friday's Valentine's Day. To those who did not know that, you're welcome. <laughs> do accordingly. Do accordingly. I don't do this very often, but one of our young people came up, uh, our youth minister told me one of our young people had received a presidential scholarship, all expense paid to Young Harris College Day in Harper. Stand up. We congratulate you. <laughs> I told him Young Harris is special to me because that's where my dad went for two years. It was just a two-year college in those days, and now it's a four-year college. Congratulations to all of ours who have gotten some kind of scholarship. I don't normally do this, but I want to say that some of you had surprised looks on your faces when uh, Jenna mentioned about the Gibsons losing both of their sons. It is horrible to lose a child, and they've lost both of theirs recently in a car wreck in Florida. Their 35 and 32 year old sons were killed instantly in a car wreck. Dennis and Joyce have been members of this church since the year 2000 and are beloved here. You may not know them, but will you pray for them? How difficult it is, the journey they're going through. When you see them, I wanna, I wanna just be pastoral a minute. Don't ask them how they're doing. I'm going to tell you how they're doing. They're here every Sunday. They haven't missed a Sunday. But they're not doing good. Their hearts are broken. Those boys left behind three grandchildren. If you want their address, call the church office. We'll give it to you. Send them a card. And when you see them, give them a hug. They need it. We're all in this together. We all grieve when any of us lose. This church has had a lot of deaths since the first of the year. We began the year with the death of an 18-year-old who drowned in our church. I don't know how people deal with such things without the church of Jesus Christ. Our scripture today is to talk about salt and light. And it is essential that we know who we are and whose we are and what we're about so that we can be as light and salt to the world. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus says, but if it's lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Not to give glory to yourselves, but to your Father in heaven. I'm getting through a biography. I've been working on a biography of Eleanor Roosevelt. And when she died, Adlai Stevenson said of her that she would rather light a candle than curse the darkness, and her glow has warmed the world. Now, wouldn't that be wonderful if it could be said of us? Wouldn't that be great? Jesus was talking to his disciples. This scripture continues what I talked about last week. Last week's sermon was the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached, the greatest sermon ever preached. Following the Beatitudes, Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now, we don't think a whole lot of salt and light because we take them for granted, but not in Jesus' day. Those were rare commodities. Salt was used for more than flavor. It was depend they depended on it to preserve their food. It was essential for life. Salt is a small little thing that makes such a difference, doesn't it? The same with light. Without light, we cease to exist. If you go back to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the first thing that God creates is light. Scientists tell us that all matter and energy come from light, and our lives depend on light. Even if you're in the darkest of darkest places, there is no darkness strong enough to extinguish the light of one small candle. Other than the sun, in Jesus' day, there were no lighters or matches or 
anything like that. The only thing they had was they would have bowls of oil in them, and they put a wick in there. And since they didn't have it, they had to, when it was lit, they had to preserve it. And it was put on a lampstand so that people would always know if, if the oil was getting low because they, didn't, they wanted to protect the light at all costs. And Jesus says, no one has that light and puts it under a, a basket and, and hides it because it's so rare. It was so valuable to them. You don't want to ever do that and let the light go. Over and over in the Bible are references to light. You are my light and my salvation, the psalmist says. Jesus says, whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Isaiah said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And remember the words of, in the Gospel of John, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Light is important. Salt is important. I don't have to tell you that too much salt on French fries will make you not eat them. In the 9 o'clock service from Brian did the children's sermon, what did the salt go on? One little boy said, eggs. Another one raised her hand and said, scrambled eggs. And then another one said, hard-boiled eggs. You know, <laughs> we were into eggs at the 9 o'clock service. Well, <laughs> you put salt on eggs, too much salt, you can't eat the eggs. And what do you do with those eggs? You throw them away. And Jesus is saying, same with us. If we're too salty, we're not good for the kingdom. Not good. Not good at all. Brian said there are 1,400 usages for salt, but I'm going to tell you there are 40 kinds of salt. 40 different kinds of salt. There's table salt. There's cannon salt. Or pickling salt, whatever you want to call it. Rock salt. What do you do with rock salt? Ice cream. Homemade ice cream. Then there's seasoning salt, such as onion salt and garlic salt and celery salt. And there are bath salts. There are chemical salts. There's ocean salt. And then there's an expression we use when we hurt somebody intentionally and we really dig in. We say that we rub salt in the wound. One of the first things we know about salt is that it adds flavor. That's what Jesus was saying. We are salt, but we're not meant to just keep it to ourselves. We're to let that salt of who we are to be a flavor in, in the world. Before the invention of the refrigerator, people salted meat to preserve it. Salt makes people thirsty. I had an English teacher in the seventh grade. He would say this all the time because he never thought we studied enough or did well enough in his class. And he would say, you're just not studying enough. And I can't make you study any more than I can. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Have you ever heard that? And what's the next part? You put a little salt in his food, maybe he'll come drink. I heard that over and over and over. Now, one of the reasons, now I don't know this personally, that bars put out free peanuts and pretzels is to make people thirsty <laughs> so they'll buy more drinks. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, those who know that. Salt and light exist for the difference that they make to other things. You add a little bit of salt to food and it enhances the flavor of the food. You don't want to just taste the salt itself. You want to taste the food in its great flavor. Likewise, light. This morning at the 9 o'clock service, the light was coming in so strong it was blinding. We don't want blinding light. We want a kind of light, though, that exposes, exposes what's around us. Plato once said, too many children are afraid of the dark, and adults are afraid of the light. Some people are afraid of the light. They're afraid to be vulnerable. They're afraid they'll be exposed. And heaven help us if people knew who we really were. But my friends, we were made to shine. We were made to shine. Edith Wharton said there are only two ways of spreading light to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. And she's right. We as God's people are to add flavor to the world. We're to shine. We do this individually and as the church. Over lunch today, here's your lunch question. You ready? Discuss who's been the salt and light in your life. How are you the salt and light around you? 
How is this church salt and light in your life? Now, one of the things you need to know about the Sermon on the Mount is we got to go back in Jesus' day, put ourselves with him where there wasn't all this light and electricity and, and salt and light were rare commodities. For Jesus to say to the crowd, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world is to say you are of tremendous value. You're of tremendous value. You're rare. You're wonderful. You're of value. For people, for Jesus to say that in our day and time would be like to say to us, you're diamonds and gold. But what do we do with diamonds and gold? We don't have to keep them to ourselves. We want to use them to bring out the best in others. Too many people forget who they are and whose they are. We're God's people and we're of value to God. I was talking to a minister friend of mine who pastors a church in a neighboring community just this week. And we called and, and taught, and I said, tell me how your church is going. And he said, this has been a very difficult year for us already. We've had three suicides in our church. Three. All adults 50 years of age in that range. Why? Why? You see, it's the purpose of the church to remind not only you and me and all of us, but everybody out here that we're of value. The cross that's on that bell tower up there, the cross that's here, the cross that's here, this beautiful sanctuary, is to remind us all that Jesus gave everything for us, everything, that we're forgiven. There's nothing we've done that can't be forgiven. There's always hope. There's always tomorrow. We are loved. We're redeemed. We're of great value. The death of actor Philip Seymour Hoffman this past week has disturbed me greatly. I liked him as an actor. He was an incredible actor. His death at 46 years of age of a heroin overdose has brought to light once again a disease that plagues our nation and the world. Recently at a Rotary meeting, the chief of police of this city of Johns Creek was there. And before the meeting, I went up to him and talked and I asked him, What's the number one crime in Johns Creek? And without hesitation, he said, heroin. Did you know that? Did you know that? The number one crime of this city is heroin. But what are we doing about it? What are we as God's people doing about that? Does everyone around here know that they're of value to God? That their bodies are the temple of God? That drugs are killing people? They're killing families as well as those who use them? We are not here to judge others. We are here to find those who have lost their way and bring them here. We have three AA meetings here on this campus every week. We have NA. Our job isn't to judge, it's to bring people so that they can be free from, from what is owning them and destroying them so they can be whole. But Jesus not only meant to the crowds of that day that you are of value. But he also was saying, do not lose your saltiness. Do not hide the light, for then we'd be of little use in the world. These verses that were read in your hearing this morning are really about Jesus saying to the crowd, you must live differently than the world. Remember your salt and light. You don't live just any way you want to live. There are those people who have light, but the spotlight's all on them. All they want is for people to see them. It's, look at me, look at me. And there are those people whose very presence is so bitter and poisonous, people don't want to be around them. Now, you know I'm a beach person. I love the beach, and I love to go to the beach. But there's one thing about the beach I don't like, and that is when I've been there for a while and I get to my car, I realize I have to wash it quickly because what will salt do to a car? 
that ocean breeze, the salt. This past week, I had to take my car to the car wash because of all the salt that was used on the, the roads, of course. You see, too much salt can be damaging and corrosive, make something bitter. And if we lose our distinction from the world's greed, uncaring, self-centered, exclusionist, unfaithfulness, and violence, then we have little purpose. We are tasteless. We are useless. Now, there are scholars who have suggested that when Jesus was preaching that, he was thinking maybe about the Essene community. The Essenes moved to Qumran, which is by the Dead Sea. You've heard of the founding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, that was the community. It was their library. The library of the Essene community at Qumran had the scrolls of the Dead Sea. Well, you see, what they did, what the Essenes did, they were upset by what all was going on in the world, so they went to the Dead Sea. Nobody really wanted to be around the Dead Sea. And they established a community away from the world. And biblical scholars are saying Jesus was not pleased with that. They were hot in their light. They were hot in their light. What we do know for a fact is Jesus was saying, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees. <laughs> Who were the scribes and the Pharisees? They were the ones walk around telling everybody how religious they were. Shine on me, shine on me. Let this light shine on me. They wore phylacteries, these things that would tell people how religious. They had long prayers in the marketplace. They wanted to be noticed all the time. And Jesus is saying, don't be like that. If you're like that, you're useless in the kingdom of heaven. Interestingly, the scribes and the Pharisees were the religious people of that day. but they did not care about the welfare of others. If we're not walking our talk, well, then we're not authentic salt nor light, and we will not do much good. This last Sunday, I think, for those of you who were here at the 11 o'clock service, I told you I could not greet you following the service. I can today, but last Sunday I couldn't. I had to go, and my wife and I got in the car and drove to Camp Glisson because I was uh, preaching there. When I arrived at the chapel of Camp Glisson, I haven't been up there in a while. It was always so good to be there on the campus of Camp Glisson. This young man came in with a guitar. And the second he walked in and started coming down, there was an aura of light about him. I can't describe it. Before he even came up and spoke to me, I thought, I like him. Don't even know him. And he came up and shook my hand and I said, I want to thank you for coming to play today. And he said, it is an honor and joy for me to play any time I can for the worship of God. I like that. He didn't start telling, let me tell you about how good I am, or whatever. And when he played for the service, there was a humbleness about him and yet a powerfulness about him. He was sort of over to the side, but his playing and his singing was remarkable. And he went over and sat on the other side without any kind of fanfare. Look at me without any arrogance about him. I want to tell you last Sunday, I was in the presence of salt and light. It meant a lot to me. So much so that I'm telling you about him today. That's how much it stirred my soul to be around him. I think of Moses, who spent time with God high on the mountaintop, and when he came down, the people said his face was glowing. His face was glowing because he'd been in the presence of God. That's the kind of shining we want to give to the world. Do people see your face is shining, your lives shining, by the way you live, your actions and your deeds? I want to tell you something. I want you to listen carefully to this. This is very profound. Dr. William Barker once wrote that astronomers claim that light travels 186,000 miles per second. If that is too hard to imagine, think of it in another way. The starlight that shines in your window today left that star about the time Shakespeare was writing his plays. You see, the light has been traveling all that time to reach us to provide its light. But then Dr. Barker says this, listen carefully. He says, the work of the first disciples still influences us today. That light is still shining 2,000 years later. Even though they've died, their light still shines to us today. I like that. 
You see, light is very important. The way we live, hopefully as disciples today, will shine for disciples hundreds and hundreds of years from now. Isn't that remarkable? Think about that. It is imperative, my friends, that we do not let our light go out. Now, John Wesley said, how would my life need to change in order to be faithful to this passage of Scripture? How are we salt and light in our homes, our school, our workplace? How about, how is the church salt and light in the world? With great honor. Jesus has honored us. You're the salt of the earth, the light of the world, but with great honor comes responsibility. My friends, our goal as the church isn't to be able to go out of here and say, our church has the most members, or we have the largest budget, which we don't, or we have the most popular youth program, or we have this, that, and the other. That's not what we're about. There are churches that get off track just like the world gets off track. We need to live in such a way in this world that people are thirsty to know Jesus Christ. We need to let our light shine in our actions, our deeds, our generosity, and our giving. I'm thankful Doug Clyburn came up today and talked a little bit about stewardship. I want to tell you that last week, I found out, you've heard of Andy Stanley, who hasn't? I don't know how many churches Andy Stanley has. It's a lot. Andy Stanley discovered that 70% of his members do not give anything to the ministry of his churches. 70%. When he found out about it, it upset him to the point that he went to his churches and told them how upset he was. And I think basically what he was saying to them, are you hot in your light? Are you hiding that flavor? You see, we can't, one of the ways we're salt and light to the world is through our missions and our ministries. Oh, don't think too badly of Andy's people. This church, it's 50% give nothing to the ministries of this church. 50%. What are we going to do about that? Have people... People not know who they are. That to be salt and light is responsible. They're people who don't know the good news of Jesus Christ. My friends, it takes money to do anything that we do. It isn't just about keeping the lights on and the heat and all that. We're talking about changing the world, for crying out loud. This comes from the greatest sermon ever preached. I want to close with this. In the younger days of railroad, and every main railroad crossing had its crossing guard, who was to signal with a lantern that a train was coming. And one night, a crossing guard fell asleep in his little shack, but he woke up and he ran out with his lantern seconds before the train came, but it was too late. There was a crash. People were killed. It was a horrible accident. We had a person from the railroad in our service this morning, and he knew this. He knew this. At the investigation, the guard was asked, were you present at your job? Did you have a lantern? And he answered, yes, he was present. And yes, he had his lantern. And he was exonerated of the charges. But later, he would make his confession. No one asked me whether or not my lantern was lit. You see, the question for us, are our lanterns lit? Is the light of Christ shining in and through us, around us, for others to see? My friends, salt and light are more important than silver and gold. Never take it lightly that we are salt and light of the world. If we do not take it seriously, then we're a little used to the kingdom of God. That's pretty strong. All of Jesus' message was about the kingdom of God. Don't forget who we are and what we're about. May we go forth to be his flavor to all we meet and to shine the light of Christ to all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.